Good morning. Welcome to worship to you and to those who aren't feeling well and are watching online. Welcome to our worship on this third Sunday of Advent, Gaudete or Rejoice Sunday. That's why we have the pink candle on the third. Uh, throughout time, rejoice has been the key word in the readings that have been chosen for the third Sunday in Advent, and you'll notice that in our readings today. God bless your worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, Gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. 
He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who worship here, worship, have hear their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel. Our Old Testament lesson comes from the prophet Zephaniah, the third chapter, and this is today's sermon text. Sing out, daughter of Zion, shout aloud, Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, you daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has removed the judgment against you. He has turned back your enemy. Israel's king, the Lord, is in your midst. You no longer need to fear disaster. In that day, Jerusalem will be told, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not give up. The Lord your God is with you as a hero who will save you. He takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O come, O key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high and close the path to misery. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel. 
The epistle lesson is from Philippians, the fourth chapter. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> oh, come, O oh day spring from on high, and cheer us by your drawing nigh. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and as dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel. Please rise out of reverence for the words and works of our Lord. In the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. So John, that's John the Baptist, kept saying to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, You offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore produce fruits in keeping with repentance. Do not even think of saying to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. Because I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. The crowds began to ask him, What should we do then? He answered them, whoever has two shirts should share with the person who has none, and whoever has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. They said, teacher, what should we do? To them he said, collect no more than what you were authorized to. Soldiers were also asking him, and what should we do? He told them, do not extort money from anyone by force or false accusation. Be satisfied with your wages. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but someone mightier than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He will gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then, with many other words, he appealed to them and was preaching good news to the people. But after John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John in prison. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated for the hymn of the day, O Lord, how shall I meet you.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus. We turn our attention to our Old Testament lesson, which began with these words, Sing out, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Dear friends in Christ, what would Christmas be like without music? Music is such a perfect way to express joy, and it works the other way, too. If you hear joyful music, it puts a smile on your face and joy in your heart. When our kids were little, and they were fussing or arguing in the back seat, we'd stick into the dashboard some Swiss yodeling music. (laughs) And they'd start bouncing and singing. You can't help it. It's just plain joyful music. It's always fun to try to make a kid laugh, but it's a lot harder sometimes to get us oldsters to smile or to sing or especially to shout for joy. So what is it that's so exciting that it's natural for Zephaniah to encourage people in Israel to shout and to sing about Christmas? You know, there are fun things associated with our celebration of Christmas. But seeing a Christmas tree doesn't exactly make a shout and sing automatically. It came a little bit close to that when they turned on the lights at Central Park that they put up this year. They are phenomenal, and they did put smiles on people's faces. But the only thing that can really get us to shout and sing about Christmas is the real thing, the heart and core of what Christmas is. And Zephaniah summarizes it so beautifully in our text. Shout and sing for joy, for your Lord is coming. Your Lord is coming to justify you through his Son. Your Lord is coming to defend you by his might. And your Lord is coming to quiet you with his love, Zephaniah says. Sing out, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, you daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has removed the judgment against you. He has turned back your enemy. It's almost jarring to come across this text after reading 80% of the book of Zephaniah. It's just an incredible contrast. In fact, at the very beginning of this chapter, Zephaniah says, Woe to the filthy, foul city, a city of oppressors. He's talking about Jerusalem. She does not listen. She does not accept correction. She does not even trust the Lord or draw near to her God. The officials within her are like roaring lions. Her judges are like hungry wolves in the evening that completely devour their prey by morning. Her prophets are reckless, treacherous men. Her priests have profaned what is holy. And yet despite all of that, the people in the city of Jerusalem thought, we're good people. How dare you tell us that's what God says? We'll ask our God. We'll ask Baal, the false god of the Canaanites. Oh, they had well earned their destruction. And you know what? People today all think the same as the Jerusalemites. We're all pretty good people. We're certainly too good to need a savior. People today also worship the false gods that they have made in their own image, in their own minds. And therefore they're convinced that they're going to go to this fantasy world they have invented but call 
heaven using the Bible's word. Scripture teaches there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. If you get your beliefs on the street, then you also have been taught, yeah, we're all basically good people. And it is that false idea, in fact, that is leading to so much chaos in our country. Prosecutors who don't even give bail, and they let people out on the street, and then they go mow down people in a parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin. That's all based on a false cult theology that people are basically good the exact opposite of what God's word teaches and it's the exact opposite of what ordinary people can even observe with their own eyes. You see, theology matters also in law enforcement and in administration and in government. Theology matters. If you believe the opposite of what God says, you're looking for trouble. After the flood, even after the worst of the worst were wiped out, God said, when the only people on earth were believers, God said, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the soil anymore because of man. For the thoughts he forms in his heart are evil from his youth. That is God's own theology on mankind and our sinful nature. And you know, our American founding fathers put this theology to work in the Constitution. They said, you can't trust one executive to run everything if he's by nature sinful. We better have a counterbalance. We better have a Congress. And just to keep those two in check, let's have a third branch of government too, the judicial branch. Between the three of them, They'll make sure that crime does not take over because that is the natural state of man. Our founding fathers knew the nature of man as scripture teaches it. And the more we abandon that, the bigger our problems will be. In fact, scripture says even we believers cannot do perfectly pure good works. Isaiah wrote, all our righteous works are like a dirty menstrual rag. That is our nature as sinful human beings. And it's against that background and the terrible condemnations of Jerusalem that suddenly, as if out of the blue, Zephaniah writes these words, Sing out, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, you daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has removed his judgment against you. And he's removed his judgment against you. And that's enough to make us shout for joy and sing. God removed the judgment against us not by ignoring our sin. God judges righteously. We had it coming. He removed the judgment from us, but he didn't remove the judgment. He took the judgment from us, and instead he put it on his only begotten son. This text is rightly an Advent text because it foretells the one who was coming to take our guilt on himself so that we could escape judgment. Isaiah describes his work. Surely he was taking up our weaknesses and he was carrying our sufferings. We thought it was because of God that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. But it was because of our rebellion that he was pierced. He was crushed for the guilt our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds 
we are healed. God redirected his just anger over sin and his just righteous punishment away from us and diverted it to his son, Jesus Christ, which is why Jesus came into our world at Christmas. Holy, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary so that he could be our stand-in, that he could be holy in our place and that he could take on himself our judgment. And when we look at what God did to his own son, there we can see how angry God was with our sin, how much punishment we deserve. You look at the blood-stained face from the crown of thorns and the holes in his hands, and you see what justice we deserved, but that God took away from us and put on his son. And because it's done and has already happened to Christ who came at Christmas, we will never have to have that judgment pinned to us. Not as long as we pin our eyes on him in steadfast faith. Sing aloud, daughter of Zion. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has removed his judgment against you. He's turned back your enemy, Satan. And now that he has taken the judgment away from us, now he will defend us by his might. Sing out, daughter of Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Israel's king is in your midst. You no longer need to fear disaster. In that day, Jerusalem will be told, Do not be afraid, Jerusalem. Do not give up. O the Lord your God is with you as a hero who will save you. Zion, of course, is the church. Judah, Jerusalem, Israel, that's us who believe. And our Lord has vowed to protect us. But what do we have to fear, you ask? Oh, there's plenty to fear if God isn't with us. There's the, the old unholy trinity, Satan, the world, and our flesh. Satan is real. He's out to get you. He wants nothing more than to devour you and to add you to the hordes of mindless slaves in his prison dungeon. All the more screams to be enjoyed forever. That's all we are to Satan. This entire promise from God in Zephaniah's scroll is surrounded by proclamations of gruesome damnation for all in Israel who have not repented, who do not believe, who have fallen away from God's word and from faith. And who of us does not know the darkness in our own hearts, the sinful flesh that we fight every day that's always trying to take over and kick out the new man. If you don't see that going on inside yourself, then you really are in danger because you've already lost track of what's happening to you. And then there's the world. There's always the world. It surrounds us. It overwhelms us with its backward morality and its upside-down values. And we live in it. We just can't avoid it. But we should not be numbed to its massive, dangerous influence on our souls. We can't defeat or even defend ourselves from these enemies on our own. We need the Lord to rescue us and that's his promise to you. Sing out, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart. Israel's king, the Lord, is in your midst. You no longer need to fear disaster. In that day, Jerusalem will be told, 
Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not give up. The Lord your God is with you as a hero who will save you. Through his word and sacrament, God strengthens our faith against Satan's constant onslaughts. Covered and protected by God's shield, we're safe. So don't take your eye off the ball. Don't step out from behind God's shield. Keep the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, strapped to your side. Keep the helmet of salvation on your head, and God will guard and protect you. The Lord your God is with you as a hero who will save you. And if that all were not enough reason to shout aloud and sing for joy, Zephaniah gives us one more. The Lord will quiet you with his love. Sing out, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart. The Lord takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. The whole reason the Lord justifies us through his Son and defends us with his might is because of his great love for us. We who were by nature unlovable by a holy God have been made lovable through the blood of Christ. Through our baptism, God has turned us into his dear and lovable children, hiding all our sins beneath the righteous garment of Christ's holiness. I don't know if it was true for you as it traditionally has been for so many Christians, but when you were baptized, they put a white dress on you, maybe one that was passed down from parents and grandparents through the generation. And that was done to perfectly symbolize the, the righteousness of Christ that hides all our sins and covers us in baptism. With our sins covered now, God can take us up in his arms and cradle us. He can feed us the pure milk of the world, word, and as we grow up, he can also feed us meat, all while continuing to quiet our fears and our hurts with his love. Sometimes as a child grows up, he doesn't want to be hugged anymore. <laughs> doesn't want to be helped. I can do it myself. And sometimes we do that with God. Now, it's true that sometimes well-meaning parents can be wrong and sometimes they can be over-smothering. But God, our Heavenly Father, is never wrong. And we never outgrow our need for his help and his love. God doesn't hold us back from growing up. He loves to see us mature in faith. And he lets his relationship with us mature right along with us as we do. Our text says, in fact, that as he sees us grow up in him, he gets so excited that he rejoices over us with singing. Imagine that. Christmas makes us sing for joy, our Christmas carols. And it makes God sing for joy about us. How wonderful is that? God sings with happiness about you, his child. You can see why this Old Testament prophecy was chosen for this third Sunday in Advent, Gaudete, Rejoice Sunday. We need the gift of God's love, and God gives it to us at Christmas. We need God's quieting and comforting love, and God gives it to us in Christ. Instead of giving us what our sins deserve, 
God justifies us and declares us clean. Instead of the pain and sorrow we would have if there had never been a Christmas miracle, God sent the hero, the great rescuer, to save us. He has given us every reason to sing and shout for joy. Let God keep cradling you in his love and feeding you with his comforting word and sacraments. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise if you're able and join in confessing the true faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Come, dear Savior, we long for your appearing. Come to cheer us with your promises as you once cheered your ancient people through their long night of waiting and watching. Come to restore our hope. Rouse us from the slumber of despair. Lift our hearts from petty earthbound gold and direct our eyes above from where you will soon come to make all things right again. Come and work in us a godly grief and a genuine sorrow over sin. Forgive us for the shameful way we've dishonored you and the shabby way we've dealt with one another. Through your mighty word, stir up in us a ceaseless yearning to give ourselves to others as you have given yourself to us. Come also to rekindle our joy as we prepare to celebrate your first coming. Do not permit a frenzied busyness to rob us of your peace or to deprive us of times to ponder and to wonder at your word. Set our hearts apart from the bustle and the clamor and the jostle of these days. Fill us with the quiet delight of finding you in the manger and keep hearts and minds undisturbed 
by the great throng that streams by uncaring. We pray also for those enduring great sorrow, for those undergoing spiritual trial, and for those whose restless hearts have no knowledge of your coming. Comfort, strengthen, and illumine them with the sweet peace born of your love, and keep them in the way of peace by your holy word. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with those members of us who are suffering from the transitory diseases that pass through. We ask that you would restore them all to health and strength before the celebration of your son's birth. Hear us also, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Come quickly, dear Lord, and fill our longing eyes with the light of your coming. We wait, we watch, and in you we put our hope. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I guess everybody here knows what the announcements are. We have our potluck. And then after that, Daughters Through Faith and the voters meeting. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord is King, your Lord and King of Thor. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our stains, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. cannot fail, he rules on earth and hell. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. Come. 
and take his servants up to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I The Lord.